Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. How is everyone feeling after a terrific Vasey conference? Woo! Cocktail hour ha helps with that. Um, so I want to welcome everyone tonight, and I also want to welcome the folks who are at home um, watching the live stream that's brought to us by the Media Factory. It's terrific that they are supporting this event um, so that folks in across the state can watch this evening's event. My name is Robin Friedner McGuire. I'm the campaign director of Let's Grow Kids, and our aim is to make sure that we let Vermonters across the state know about the important role that child care plays in the healthy development of young children and in supporting Vermont's economy and your very important work in supporting our children and families across the state. And so we were so, we were really excited when Sonia Raymond called us and asked if we could support uh, putting on this event this evening, and it's just been a wonderful partnership and collaboration with Vasey. And we're also thrilled to have the support of so many partners, both statewide and here local in Chittenden County. If you look at your program sheet, you will see the list of ter terrific partners, and I just want to thank you all for getting the word out and letting people know about this event. Um, the other piece to look at on that program is the list of questions that we have um, for this evening and that we have provided the candidates um, in advance. Uh, our partners got um, out a link and provided uh, questions to us uh, through their networks. And so the development of these questions really were basically what were the strongest themes that came out in the number of questions that we received. We received nearly 70 questions. Um, so that's how those questions were developed. The last piece is most, a lot of people are saying, why are you really focusing on having a gubernatorial candidate event on early childhood? And really, we have been working with our partners across the state to make sure that everyone who cares about young children here in the state are registered to vote and get out and vote in this election and elections to come. And so everyone in here, if you haven't registered to vote, please do. You can go to our website at letsgrowkids.org. There's a link. You can actually do it online, online now, which is amazing. Um, and make sure that you get out the word to your families that you work with and with your colleagues as well, because it's very critical. It's another way that we advocate for young children here in the state. And without further ado, I was so thrilled that when I reached out to Darren Perrin to ask him to moderate this event, he did not even hesitate a nanosecond um, in uh, accepting the offer. Um, Darren does such an amazing job covering very timely and important issues uh, across the state to Vermont for Vermonters. And this is one of the issues that he has um, dug, in, uh, dug into. Uh, if, if you are not familiar with all the amazing work that Darren has done, he is a WCX anchor, and he's an award-winning reporter and executive producer at WCAX Channel 3. Um, he has won an Emmy Award, 10 uh, Edward R. Morrow Awards, 10 Emmy Award nominations, and more than a dozen Associated Press Awards. In 2009, Darren was the only non-network reporter in the U.S. to be nominated for a GLAAD Award. His war reporting helped win WCX, a VAB Broadcaster of the Year Award. And in 2016, Darren won national recognition, rec recognition from the NLGJA. He was awarded the prestigious Excellence in Journalism Award by that organization. And before he joined WCX in 1995, he was a reporter for the Chronicle in his hometown in Barton, Vermont. Do we have any folks here from the Northeast Kingdom? They're all watching live stream. Okay, okay. <laughs> He's currently now anchors the Channel 3 News at 6 p.m. He's an executive producer. And also, he hosts You Can Quote Me. So we are very pleased to have Darren moderate this evening's event. Thank you. Thank you so much. Robin, thank you for that introduction. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you again for uh, watching at home as well. Vermont has a big decision ahead, a new leader to pick, and I hope that tonight you folks will be a little bit more informed when you leave here uh, in making your decisions at the polls. 
So you're here to hear from the candidates, not me. Hopefully you hear from me every night at 6. So let's meet the candidates. Sue Minter is 55. She was born in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Come on up, Phil. Uh, Sue. You're first. And lives in Waterbury with her husband, David Goodman. They have two kids. Minter is a planner by profession, studying at Harvard and MIT. She served three terms in the Vermont House representing Waterbury. She served as Irene Recovery Officer, the Deputy Secretary of Transportation, Transportation Secretary. Minter coached youth soccer and figure skating in Waterbury. Welcome. <laughs> Phil Scott is 58. He was born in Barrie and lives in Montpelier with his wife, Diana. He has two daughters. Scott is a businessman and UVM alum. He owns, co-owns Dubois Construction and is in his third term as Lieutenant Governor. Before that, he spent five terms as a Washington County State Senator. Scott also races cars and is a three-time track champion at Thunder Road. Welcome to you. <clears throat> So we uh, backstage had a coin toss to decide who goes first with opening statements, and that's where we begin tonight. And uh, I believe that, Sue, you won that coin toss. So go ahead with your opening statements. You have two minutes. Well, it's great to be here tonight. Thank you so much to Let's Grow Kids, to Vasey, to Darren, and all of the sponsors of this organization raising this important issue of the future of our children. Um, I know that early childhood education is really the foundation upon which so much is built. No one uh, does it, not only does it benefit the well-being of our families and children, but it also can be a determining factor in our state's overall affordability, uh, our health, and our economic prosperity. You know, every leader brings her own experience to the job. I uh, grew up uh, the youngest of four children. Uh, I was the only girl. And I had three big brothers who loved to kind of push me around and tease me. But I realized really that they uh, helped me learn to stand up for myself and to fight for what I believe in. And that's exactly what I've been trying to do. I've had the privilege of serving for Vermonters in some of our toughest times. As a legislator during the Great Recession, standing up for our children and our seniors. As the Irene recovery officer after the worst disaster in nearly a century, helping to rebuild roads, bridges, and communities. And as Secretary of Transportation, uh, working to keep our bridges safe and balancing a $600 million budget. And for the last year, I've been traveling this state talking to Vermonters from Bennington to Newport, really hearing about the struggles, struggles like affordable childcare, young adults who are saddled with college debt, seniors who can't find affordable housing or adequate home-based care. And this is what I want to do, find solutions to these challenges. I want to help grow economic opportunity for the next generation with affordable child care, livable wage jobs, strong communities, accessible higher education. I have a track record of setting challenges setting goals and meeting those goals, and that's exactly what I'll do as your next governor. Thank you. Phil Scott, you have two minutes. Well, thank you very much uh, for having us here tonight. It's uh, incredibly important, uh, this election. Uh, we're all here today to talk about Vermont's youth, and I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to reflect on the tragedy that happened uh, this past week. I want to express my condolences to the families, friends, and the community, and I know it has been particularly hard on, on Sue this week and her family, and I just wanted to acknowledge that and know that we're thinking about them in that community. We know the first years of a person's life are the most impressionable. We know early investments pay high dividends. We know that high quality, affordable child care can help mitigate future costs in education, health care, and in our, our correction systems. We also know that quality child care is essential to our economy. And I'm here today to tell you that I'm an advocate 
and a listening partner, and I will be if, if elected as governor in the future. And regardless of what you might hear from others, what you might hear in radio ads and, and on TV, I believe we need to invest in early education. I believe the science is real. We know that a child's brain is 90% uh, is developed by the age of five. And that means we should provide the best education and care possible, especially in those early years. And as you may know, I'm a contractor. I know the value of a solid, well-built foundation. Programs and services in the early years of life are critical and essential in making sure our children have that solid foundation. Vermont's economic prosperity relies on its most important asset, which is our people. I truly believe, and that is why I will explore ways to invest in our youth, to please do not believe the mistruths about who I am and what I believe in. I'm pro-choice, I support marriage equality, I believe in equal pay for equal work, and I believe in the importance of pre-K and early childhood education. Again, thank you for having us tonight. Thank you to both candidates. Let's go over the rules before we start with the questions. There will be at least five questions tonight that the candidates, as Robin had mentioned, were provided before uh, this uh, forum began by Let's Grow Kids. Each candidate will have three minutes to respond to each question. I may ask a follow-up question if I think we all need a little bit of clarification here. Candidates will not address each other. There will be an opportunity for rebuttals during closing statements if you wish to address anything that your opponent has brought up. You'll have two minutes to make your closing statements. So, let's begin. A coin toss decided who goes first. I believe, Phil Scott, you're up with three minutes, and here is the first question. Early childhood nutrition is the topic. Early childhood is a critical time for healthy development, but more than 25,000 Vermont children live in households without consistent access to adequate food. These children are more likely to be frequently sick, recover from illness slowly, and be hospitalized more frequently than children with adequate food access. Lack of adequate healthy food can also impair a child's ability to perform well in school and is linked to higher levels of behavioral and emotional problems from early learning through adolescence. As governor, how will you ensure access to adequate healthy food for all children and their families? Phil Scott, you have three minutes. Well, thank you very much. And uh, healthy habits in particular, a nutritious diet and regular exercise are really learned young and are very important and can last a lifetime. They lead to healthier teens, healthier adults, healthier seniors, and it's these very habits that help drive down healthcare costs because we're investing in prevention rather than managing chronic illnesses like diabetes, heart disease, and so forth. Our schools and childcare facilities are an ideal place to start instilling these healthy habits in our children. We hope their parents are making the proper choices and nutrition choices at home as well. But if not, at least kids will have access to good food at school and be introduced to the importance of taking ownership over their own health. And hopefully, the kids can take those lessons to help educate the parents as well. I, I just remember when I was uh, about 20 years ago, when my kids were younger, 25 years ago, growing up, how much they taught to me. They were in the D.A.R.E. program. They taught to me about the use of seat belts and so forth. And it's them that drove me to, to make sure that I had my seat belt attached. So those are healthy uh, in terms of uh, teaching adults as well. That's why I will continue to support the Farm to School program as well. It's a wonderful example of a win-win partnership between schools, their communities, and the agricultural sector. The program provides healthy local food for our students and education about where their food comes from so the students have a real connection in terms of the healthy meals they're eating. It also provides support for our local farms, which are one of the Vermont's most important legacy industries. As of January of 2016, the Vermont Farm to School program reached 120 schools, reaching more than 30,000 uh, school children. We also need to make sure that no child comes to school hungry. 
They should be ready to learn, and I will continue to support free and reduced price meals, including breakfast, so that we can partner with community agencies and schools to make sure these students will have access to food during weekends, holiday breaks, and summer vacation as well. I think there are also many opportunities uh, to be found through the gleaning program around the state where unsold quality crops are reclaimed instead of going to waste and distributed to sites that feed our most vulnerable neighbors and provide for families with access to fresh, local, clean food. We need to get serious about the economy and affordability. We need to change the economic and demographic path we're on, making sure everyone who wants a job and has one and that every family is economically secure and economically independent is the very best and most empowering way to end childhood hunger. Thank you, Phil Scott. Sue Minter. So it's clear from local data that accessing healthy food is a significant issue for low-income families in Vermont. And we already know that one in five Vermont children experiences hunger because they lack access to enough full food to fully meet their basic needs. I believe this is something we must continue to address. Children living in food insecure homes are at greater risk for poor health, for nutritional deficiencies and obesity, as well as developmental delays, poor academic achievement, depression, and increased aggressive or hyperactive behavior. I've seen a tremendous improvement in nutrition in my own school, and Phil, thank you for recognizing the tragedy that has occurred. And I know our school community is so strong and will get through this as we have come together in many ways, including helping to make sure our kids have access to healthy meals. Uh, when my first child, Ariel, uh, was in the, pre the primary school, um, we had a free and reduced lunch program. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't coming off your time. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Is that all right? Okay, can people hear me better now? Yeah. Oh, man, do I get to start all over? Go ahead. <laughs> Look, I was just starting to tell you about how uh, our school, uh, the primary school and middle school at the Harvard Union High School, has really engaged in making healthy meals. Uh, as a mom, uh, trying to make sure my kids were getting their breakfast uh, and I was pushing nutrition in the morning because I know it's critical to brain development and to learning. We really had begun early uh, in that phase of just getting free and reduced lunch breakfast opportunities for others. It's now not, is it working now? Okay, so thank you so much for helping. Um, so then we had just started the first program and I was a volunteer in the school and I worked in the kitchens and helping uh, to get a free and reduced lunch breakfasts. But um, now we have expanded in such an important way so that A, everyone has access to what we call universal meals, so there's no stigma attached. But most importantly, it's nutritious food and we have a great program and my hat is off to our folks, uh, our nutrition providers at our schools for, yes, using local food, nutrition food, but having it available at the door. So kids in the middle school get off the bus, and as they are running to class, they can pick up yogurt and uh, granola and fruit. So we need to build upon these great community programs and these great partnerships. I want to continue to explore the feasibility of universal meal programs within our schools an approach that dozens of schools are now doing. I want to make sure we provide more fresh, nutritious meals and snacks to childcare providers and home care, pro home care providers and after school programs. I want to expand the research of innovative programs like the Vermont Food Bank's Veggie Van Gogh's that deliver fresh produce to schools and churches and parent-child centers. And I had a great visit to the Capstone uh, Community Kitchen. So many programs we can do when we work together and have the mission of making sure all children must have access to affordable, healthy food. This is a basic human need that should not continue to haunt us in the 21st century in America. Thank you, Samantha. 
Our second question is about access to quality, affordable child care and after school programs. Another issue impacting Vermont families is access to child care. Currently, many working families in Vermont are facing tough choices. When it comes to balancing work and family, almost 50% of Vermont's infants and toddlers likely to need child care don't have access to regulated child care programs, and more than 22,000 Vermont children are waiting for an available after school program. What would you say to young professionals who are parents or who want to start a family and who face the hard choice of either dropping out of the workforce or moving out of the state because they cannot find quality, affordable child care or after school care for their children? Sue Minter, you have three minutes. So I am a working mom with two kids and I understand how stressful and challenging it is to balance work and family but especially finding affordable childcare. Um, and I know uh, that it is critical for families to be able to go back to work so that they know when they know their kids are being well cared for. And I will tell you, I hear these concerns throughout the campaign trail. So you all have been doing really good work, making your providers and your parents into great advocates because we have both been hearing a lot about this need. I know we need to keep working together to make sure more Vermonters have access to affordable and reliable childcare. And I know this has huge implications for our state. Look, over 40% of our kids are coming to kindergarten now unready to learn. What does that mean for the future? Because when you start from behind, it is very hard to catch up. So I believe we have an obligation to work together to change that story. I know that it's particularly acute among low-income families. 13% of Vermont families with children live be below the federal poverty line. But among households in which women are the primary breadwinners, 37% fall below the poverty line. And let's remember, that when women have economic security, our families have economic security, and we have greater economic prosperity. And right now in this state, 43% of the women who work full time still can't meet their basic needs. I have proposals to help get more childcare providers educated with two years tuition free at Community College of Vermont or Vermont Technical College. We need to build the childcare workforce. We need to build a system of care. And I know you're all working hard to understand the data of where the needs are, where the supply chain is, and how we grow that supply chain and create a system of accessible, affordable care. I want to continue to work and be your, pro, your partner. The educational opportunity of our kids and the economic security of our families is the foundation of our economic prosperity for the future. As your governor, I want to keep on building on the great work that you're doing. I will be your partner to move forward in these challenging times to make sure that our families can have access to childcare so they can go back to work, to make sure our kids have great nutrition and care, early care, and after school care, care, so that they can become the productive, successful economic successes of our future. That's the Vermont that we are all looking for. That's the Vermont I want to help build for our future. Thank you. Phil Scott, three minutes. We were fortunate when my kids were young, uh, both of us worked, uh, and we had We Explorers in Morrisville, which was a church-based uh, pre, uh, preschool program. So we were fortunate. We also had uh, my aunt, uh, who is retired, a registered nurse, who was like a grandmother to my kids, and, and then we were able to rely on a, a farm family uh, that needed the extra income. So we made it work, but there's no doubt that too many Vermonters face a difficult decision of dropping out of the workforce to take care of their children due to the lack of high quality and affordable child care. And this is precisely why affordable child care, after school care, and infant care are essential. A lack of access to these resources is a huge barrier for working parents who are trying to enter the workforce. 
Every corner of Vermont is struggling to provide these necessary programs for working families. Many of the young moms I speak with talk about these lack of options and how 40 to 50 percent of their monthly income is, uh, goes back to childcare. And if we're serious about investing in our workforce, we need to address the issue of affordable childcare. I think state government can play a role in better coordinating childcare in order to reduce costs. For, ex for example, I think one of the major expenses for childcare providers is building and maintenance costs. If communities could partner with childcare providers in order to offer spaces for a childcare center, the cost of doing business could be drastically reduced. There are empty rooms in schools, libraries, and community centers all across Vermont, and that could be used for these purposes. Here we have an opportunity that we have not fully explored as of yet, and I look forward to do so, doing so as governor. Similarly, we need to find ways to encourage on-site childcare in people's workplaces. Again, state government can play a role here by incentivizing the creation of these spaces or helping to at least coordinate them, much as it has been in the creation of co-working and incubator spaces for growing businesses. I see the working, this working best uh, for infant care, which I understand is the hardest uh, to find and amongst the most expensive. So I would look to you, all of you and our business partners to explore ways in which on-site care can be a win-win for the employee and the employer. Simply put, one of the primary reasons why our economy in Vermont is struggling is that we're unable to retain the key 25 to 45 age group, the demographic group. This lack of access to high quality affordable childcare contributes to this problem. And we must make improving uh, access a priority. State government can take action with facilitating coordination, providing incentives, which are some of the state steps I will take as governor. Thank you both. Uh, this third question deals with a topic that uh, you've addressed a little bit here. It deals with the challenges facing child care providers. Brain science has shown that child care workers play an important role in the healthy development of the kids in their care. But in Vermont, many of these professionals don't earn a livable wage and often don't have benefits. A recent Vermont Child Development Division survey revealed that fewer people are entering the early childhood workforce and that it's difficult to hire qualified individuals. What are some specific ways, as governor, that you would support Vermont's early childhood professionals and stop this field's talent drain? Phil Scott, three minutes. Well, obviously, this is an incredibly difficult uh, issue uh, that we're going to take up. I, I think we need to look at our child uh, financial assistance program and as, analyze how we can best adapt the funding for the program to increasing uh, this cost of child care and providing opportunities uh, for uh, improvement. I, I think uh, as well, uh, but before we commit to, to spending more money on any programs, I think our first step was always to look back at the existing process and system and see if we can improve or streamline it and make sure we're able to uh, measure the results. I, uh, I've talked a lot in this campaign uh, about how we invest in our economy and uh, how we're going to reinvest uh, to grow this economy. We have an incredible uh, problem on our hands in terms of the demographics of the state, uh, that we, uh, we have this stagnant population. We're losing this category from 25 to 45, which includes all of us and all the child care providers as well. And we need to incentivize ways to stay. And there are many barriers in the way. And But we have to address that first, because what we're doing, we're losing, we've lost 30,000 people out of that category between 25 and 45 since the last census. And uh, when you think about that, that's, that is our workforce. Those are the folks that uh, buy homes, have families, utilize services, buy products, and uh, in the end, uh, pay taxes. And so if there's 30,000 less of them, uh, which we've proven uh, through the census, that means the burden's on the rest of us. And that means the economy's not working. So there are many, many barriers in the way of doing that. I think housing is a, is a big part of that. And I think that that's something that we have to, to address to incentivize uh, keeping our youth here and keeping professionals here and attract professionals here. But we have to revitalize the economy. We, we're going to have to do whatever we can to restore the vitality of the economy in order to pr prosper in any respect. So 
Uh, that's been my focus. I think we have to, uh, again, uh, continue uh, to seek ways of, of working our way out of this with all of us pulling in the same direction in order to do so. Sue Minter, three minutes. So I've been looking at the data a little bit and seeing uh, this acute change uh, really since 2010, uh, almost a 10 percent decrease in the number of licensed or registered providers. And I don't know the driving factors behind that. But we also know that the most acute needs are for our infants and toddlers. Now, we want to work to implement universal pre-K. I'm so proud of our state for being, I believe, the first or one of the first to pass this. Uh, each community is working in different ways. I am uh, pleased by how uh, my particular community is able to do a public-private partnership with school-based care as well as uh, care throughout the community. I want to talk about what's the driving challenges, which is economic challenge, and why my campaign is about creating more jobs and economic opportunity for the future, and why I've developed specific plans for growing our economy and livable wage jobs and the workforce to fill them. Invest Vermont, investing in our downtowns, our villages, with more infrastructure, supporting our entrepreneurs, affordable housing, but creating opportunities for also childcare centers, like we've done in Waterbury, a brand new childcare center opening up right next to an affordable housing unit so that we can actually make opportunities for those folks and those kids to be together and literally walk to school when they get there. My Innovate Vermont focuses on four key strategic sectors of our economy and looks to have task force in each one of them, in advanced manufacturing, high tech, and what I call the green economy, uh, energy efficiency and renewable energy, and the farm, food, and forest economy. Now, what's so important is that we are going to have innovators in those in, uh, industries work together in the first 90 days on task forces. The key part is how do we bring private sector and innovation together with government to solve our problems? Because government isn't going to solve this problem alone. And it's why we need to connect the dots between what the businesses are looking for in terms of a workforce, what the employees need in terms of a workplace, and how do we get that workforce. That's also connected to my Vermont promise, the two years tuition free, community and technical college, getting people on a pathway, including childcare providers, which we have at CCV, and my proposal to make sure that we have childcare provided at every CCV opportunity so that we can get kid, people, kids into programs, teen parents into programs, dislocated workers with families into programs, and build that workforce for the future. Look, we have huge challenges. We've got to build the workforce for the future. Education equals workforce equals economic development. And when we look at the whole picture and recognize the relevance of having the needs of women and children met, that's when we're going to actually be Thank able you. to make our state more affordable. Thank you, Suminter. Fourth question, uh, another challenge for Vermont families, and that's family leave. Currently, the United States, Suriname, Papua New Guinea, and a few small Pacific Island nations are the only countries in the world that do not guarantee some type of paid family leave. For families with new children, research has linked paid leave to better health for mothers and babies, lower rates of postpartum depression, and newborn and infant mortality, and higher rates of breastfeeding and childhood vaccinations. In the U.S., California, New Jersey, Rhode Island, Washington, and neighboring New York have all passed family leave insurance laws that enable employees to take leave to care for a new child or a sick family member. As governor, what policies would you support to help families provide the best start for children and care for one another in times of serious illness? Sue Minter, three minutes. Well, I strongly support paid family leave. We need to build off of our sick, paid sick leave and do paid family leave. And I will look forward to the reports coming forward on this proposal that we have an insurance program for all employees. And let me tell you why. 
When I had my first child, when I was pregnant with my first child, Ariel, I was afraid to tell my employer. I didn't know if there was, there was not a family leave policy, and I didn't know if I would have a job to come back to. And I remember the anxiety that that carried. Um, I, on my second child, had uh, the great opportunity of working for the state of Vermont, uh, a member of the state employees union, and I had paid leave. And the differences between those experiences of pregnancy and of postpartum care and life were pretty stark for me. And it's why I feel so strongly that people should never have to choose between their job and their family. And with more and more women coming into the workforce, of course this is more urgent. But it isn't just for new moms, it's also for new dads. And it's also to help care for family members who are ill. And certainly I had that opportunity when my dad was in hospice. And thanks to the opportunities provided for me as a state employee, a member of a union, I had that opportunity. I want to make sure it isn't just a person's circumstance and how lucky they are to be working where they do, but in fact be part of the policy that we care for our workers and that we make sure our workforce has the needs taken care of. As Secretary of Transportation, I worked hard to retain employees. Every employer is challenged by this. One of the ways I wanted to make our workplace uh, a place that young people wanted to live, work, and stay is by creating lactation facilities, by the way, because I didn't have one. And now I had the opportunity to see young women caring for their babies, able to continue to nurse their young ones as they came back to work, having flexibility in the workplace. This is something that is done in most places. Many states are starting it. I am going to be pushing forward to be the next state that is taking on this challenge because we need to work together with our employers and come up with these solutions. I like the idea of having a uh, insurance pool that employees pay into that they can access whether, regardless of where they work. This is not to be an additional burden to work to employees, to, um, to employers. It's actually to make it more possible for them to keep a strong, healthy, happy, successful workforce. Bill Scott, three minutes. Well, I know many of you support mandatory paid family leave, and I have to be honest, and I know that it would be easy for me to just promise the same and tell you what you want to hear, but I don't think we can afford it right now. Our economy is too fragile, and we simply can't absorb it. Families can't absorb the higher consumer costs it would create, and many businesses can't absorb it either. I was at a business today, as a matter of fact. I was in Bennington uh, this morning, and there was a bakery there, and I've, I've been into the bakery many times over the last number of years, and uh, they were telling me how much they were struggling uh, to survive. In fact, they've had to lay off a couple of employees. Uh, the bypass has affected them, and they're just not sure how they can make it. They're working more and more hours. They're, they were uh, husband and wife own the business, in fact, the, the husbands had to take another job, and they have family and friends filling in the gaps. And they're struggling just to make it. I don't, I'm not sure they're going to make it. We, uh, the reality is we have to get back to the fiscal fundamentals and focus on growing our economy, creating more jobs, and making Vermont more affordable before we place another mandate on businesses. Many of them, like this bakery, is a small family business. And I agree, no one should have to choose between working and caring for their family. But let's be honest about what it's going to take to build an economy where we can afford the options and services necessary to solve this very important problem. I've been in business for over 30 years, and I know most Vermont businesses want to and strive to do the best for their employees. We do this for many reasons, the first being we truly care about our employees. I know my team is like my family. Another reason is that we're a small state and word travels and your reputation, my reputation, is of a great uh, concern to me and we want to make sure that we have a great place to work uh, and that means a lot to me. 
Providing benefits like this has been a healthy competitive advantage for my company as well. But we have to be able to offer flexible leave without a costly mandate. We've done that. And we do this because we care. We understand how important our workforce is to our success. And I think many other companies throughout Vermont support that similarly. We need to reduce the cost and regulatory burden for employers so they can afford to expand, hire, and increase wages and benefits to attract the best talent. I want to make it very clear that I will not repeal the Vermont's current paid sick leave law. I just don't support adding additional burdens because that doesn't change what a business can afford. And I'm really concerned these higher costs will be felt by the employees through reduced hours and, and layoffs and by customers and our economy as a whole as the cost of living increases. Thank you both. Our fifth question is related to many of the issues that uh, we've heard tonight. Uh, being done by the Blue Ribbon Commission on Financing High Quality Affordable Child Care. And that leads us to this fifth question. This fall, the Blue Ribbon Commission will issue a report that provides recommendations regarding affordability and financing options for high quality early care and learning in Vermont. Right now, middle income Vermont families are paying up to 40% of their income on child care, and nearly 80% of infants and toddlers likely to need care don't have access to it. As governor, how will you act on the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission? Phil Scott, three minutes. Well, I look forward to seeing the report of the commission. I believe it's due in November. After reviewing the recommendations, uh, we'll take a look. Uh, however, I think we can all identify what the underlying problem really is. It's the lack of access to affordable child care. And it's of crucial importance to get people into the workforce and to, so we can fuel our economy. And I've talked a lot about fueling our economy. This isn't the first time, nor will it be the last, when I've been asked whether I would support putting more funding into a particular policy or program. And it would be easy, again, as I said before previously, it'd be easy to say yes to every request, but that's not the right answer. If we're serious about getting our economy back on track and making Vermont more affordable for our families and businesses, we have to prioritize pro-growth areas like early education and job training, and I will. And we need to have the courage to find savings elsewhere. I think there's money to be saved within programs themselves. I, I would use the PICUS report that was just uh, done by the Joint Fiscal Office. It was a legislative report. And they identified as a neutral, uh, nonpartisan uh, look at what we could do within the education system. And the PICUS report said we could save $150 million if we instituted some of these changes. And I would advocate that maybe out of the $150, we could use a, a portion of that uh, for, for pre-K, early childhood development. We could use some maybe for child care. And then maybe we could give some back uh, to the taxpayers as well. But we have to have the courage to look at the, the system first. I believe the first step in every situation is to look at the current system and see how it can be improved, either by looking to streamline the processes, find efficiencies, or uh, as I've suggested, in this case, reallocate existing resources or assets that aren't being used to their fullest potential. I believe we should look at the implementation of regulations in a more thoughtful and a mu much more supportive manner. And I hear a lot about what we, uh, we have uh, with Act 166, specifically with the AOE and the AHS. And while we're at odds over implementation, uh, some are leaving child care providers stuck in the middle and adding costs isn't the answers. So I want to be clear. Uh, I will not raise taxes and further burden already struggling Vermont families, especially when there are areas of opportunity to be innovative. Uh, I think we need to facilitate these community provider partnerships and look at new incentives in order to reduce the cost of child care and improve the quality. And I think there are opportunities where we can implement the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Commission. And again, I look forward to seeing that report in the next few weeks. Sue Minter, three minutes. So we all know that uh, child care presents huge barriers for many, many Vermonters. And I do not want to put a pause button on our innovative ideas of moving forward as a state. And I do look forward to uh, the commission reports. And I am hopeful 
it will come up with creative ideas. Uh, because it is when we think differently that we do come up with new ideas. And bringing many sectors to the table, because this, again, isn't a government problem. This is a societal issue. And we want to make sure the business community is at the table with us. Uh, when I, uh, our workplace at the Agency of Transportation is housed at National Life. And National Life has provided an opportunity for a childcare facility right next door. This kind of opportunity um, is something that I think facilitates the ability for young workers at the state and at National Life. So more facilities need, but we need to have creative solutions. You know, I do want to really build upon the issue that Phil is raising about our economy overall, and I think it presents the differences between us. I know that we need investment to grow our economy. We know that a dollar spent on childcare results in saving $7 down the road. So we can't just look at cutting now. We need to actually look at building the future. The I Invest Vermont program is really based on my experience in leading uh, during my leadership time at the Agency of Transportation when we put public investment into the infrastructure in the city of Barrie, $19 million of new water, wastewater, sewer, a new main street with a pedestrian orientation. That was six years ago. And within six years, that work with affordable housing, with redevelopment of brownfields, all of those different public programs in federal, state, and local investment have now leveraged over $45 million of private investment. And Barrie is now growing. It's uh, manufacturing, commercial, residential, and retail, 350 new jobs, 24 new businesses. I've seen a similar experience in my community of Waterbury, which was wiped out after Irene. We were a ghost town, but we didn't give up. We didn't say, let's cut. We said, let's pull together. Let's figure out how we can invest. And now, six years later, we've got a booming downtown. And we've got childcare right next to affordable housing. We've got a great craft beer industry. I believe we can build the economy of the future when we think strategically about our investments. And that includes making sure our families have places for their kids to be safe to be well-educated, to be well-cared for, and to have nutritious meals so that they can work and make ends meet. It's putting it all together. Sue Minter, thank, thank you. you. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, healthcare costs, as both of you know, and probably everybody in this room knows, I certainly do, I feel like we talk about it just about every night, huge on everybody's plate right now. Um, this question uh, from uh, Let's Grow Kids, even though Vermont has a strong child health insurance program, Dr. Dinosaur, there are still families who avoid taking their children to the doctor because of the high out-of-pocket costs associated with their private plans. As governor, what would you do to address this? Sue Minter. Well, thank you for raising health care, because I really think it is the rising cost of health care that is breaking the budgets of our families, our schools, and pushing up property taxes, and our state budget. So we must address the rising cost of health care. For health care, I want to talk about three things. Number one, we need to address what I think has failed too many Vermonters, Vermont Health Connect. And I plan to put fresh eyes on this program, make sure what we do is to make it succeed. That is a top priority. Number two, we need to move away from the current fee-for-service program that is how we pay for health care and move to a system where we actually incentivize health and outcomes and community-based care rather than incentivizing more pills and prescriptions and procedures. This is critically important because if we don't reduce the cost, we will never move forward with a sustainable economy we will never address affordability of our economy. Now, there are innovative ideas on moving back forward, back to the discussion around universal access to care. And there are two programs. One is looking to increase Dr. Dinosaur to all kids age to age 26. The other is looking at universal access to primary care. Now, I'm interested in getting to those conversations. 
Um, I want to understand what the costs are and how we might look to pay for them, but I am interested in understanding what the opportunities and the benefits for long-term savings and better healthy outcomes, which of course adds to more savings in the long run. We have a lot to do together. Healthcare is a major driver of our challenge, and I want to be a leader that continues this discussion. But I know we have to be pragmatic. And having someone, having been uh, running the second largest agency of state government, managing 1,300 employees, and balancing a $600 million budget, has given me quite a bit of experience in understanding budgeting, understanding long-term challenges, and acute needs. We need to have a governor that is looking both to the long-term as well as the near term. And that's what really my programs, when you put them all together, are looking to create economic opportunity and prosperity for the future, growing our villages and downtowns, making sure we have affordable childcare and affordable college so more kids can get ready for qualifications for livable wage jobs and a secure economic future. It is essential that we address the challenges of our workforce into the future. Thank you very much. Phil Scott, three minutes. I, I think uh, Sue and I agree uh, that the first step is to make the exchange work, and my plan would be to pull the plug on it. I think we're far overdue. This should have happened a couple of years ago. This has been a disaster. It's been a $200 million-plus disaster. It's going to cost us a lot of money to maintain it in the future as well with the high maintenance costs over the years. And that's the operating costs are some of my uh, real uh, uh, desires to do something different because the administration has said could be $45 million a year, and we can't afford that. We, can, uh, we should be down in the 20 to $25 million range. So pull the plug on uh, Vermont Health Connect, transition to either the federal exchange or to another state's uh, plan IT structure. And there are many, many options. Uh, the second is this uh, new all-payer model uh, that's been talked about a lot over the last uh, couple of weeks, and uh, it's an interesting proposal. It sounds interesting because uh, we are replacing the current fee-for-service model with something else, which I think is the step in the right direction, but the devil really is in the details, and this is being forced upon us at a much rapid pace where not everybody understands it. In fact, Sue and I were at a forum a couple of weeks ago. Uh, of hospital administrators and, and uh, hospital association. And I asked, I posed the question to them. Did any of them have any idea? Could they explain to us what the all-payer waiver would do for the state of Vermont? Not a single hand came up. And that's concerning uh, because uh, that means a lot of us don't understand this. And if we're going to do this and change the way we, we deliver uh, services, we better have a better understanding of this and all be on the same page. I also believe, and, and I support uh, Dr. Dinosaur, I believe uh, the success in Dr. Dinosaur is, has been substantial uh, for Vermont. And I look forward to the study that's uh, coming out on Dr. Dinosaur 2.0 in, in January, and uh, we'll take a look and see what it says. I think there are a number of important questions we need to ask ourselves, although, uh, when we're looking at Dr. Dinosaur and costs associated with private plans, for example, how are the out-of-pocket costs impacting Do Dr. Dinosaur's affordability for parents? Is it the upfront costs which are later reimbursed? Or are co-pays associated with private plans becoming more and more unaffordable? It's ultimately the parent's responsibility to see that their child has proper medical care. However, the state has a crucial role in helping parents support their children. If we need to restructure certain aspects of the Dr. Dinosaur program, to make sure the funding uh, eases the financial burden and stresses on, on uh, the working families, then I'm all for it. And I look forward to more conversations with parents around the state on this very, very important issue. Because I know that raising children is not easy, it's not inexpensive, but it's one of the most rewarding things we'll ever do. Thank you both. Thanks to Let's Grow Kids for the questions this evening. Now it is time to move on to closing statements. A coin toss decided who goes first. Suminter, you're up with two minutes. So thank you, everyone who came here to listen tonight. Um, I have really spent the last year meeting with Vermonters 
from Bennington to Newport and having incredible conversations, really discovering every corner of this state, learning about many, many challenges and looking for solutions. And it has always been, um, you know, hearing the challenges can be cha troubling, but I am always enriched and inspired by the people I meet who are stepping up to address our challenges. And I think many of you in this room are part of that. I know how critical early childhood education as a social determinant for health and the future of our state. And that's why I have stood by policies to support early childhood education, to support childcare and after school care, nutrition. That's why I support programs like paid family leave, which we know benefits children and families and our economy. I want to make sure that we have affordable health care. I believe Vermonters need a raise. I know we are facing tough times, but I've had the privilege of working really with Vermonters in some of our toughest times, particularly knowing what's possible when Vermonters come together, as they did after Irene, with a united mission. I know that we can do amazing things. And that's why I want to build on our success. I don't want to say no to our opportunities to the future. I don't want to put the pause button on. And I think that there are real differences between Phil and I in this election. I want to tell you that I am here, like so many of you, because I know that too many children are going hungry, too many families are in shelters, and we have challenges to solve together. I will just end by saying that I'm also here because in 225 years of history, Cementor. Vermont has only elected one woman governor. Thank you. I'm ready to be the second, and I hope Cementor, you're ready thank for thank you very much. <laughs> Maybe about five seconds over, so we'll go 205. <laughs> Bill Scott. Uh, thank you again all for coming uh, tonight. I've made it a practice in both my political and personal life to treat others the way I expect to be treated with respect and civility. And that's what I'd like to end on, the importance of leadership. We have a deficit of faith and trust in the government and our leaders both here and nationally. And I think it's incumbent upon each and every one of us to act appropriately in our own backyards to inspire others to do the same. It's about instilling that faith and trust has been lost. When you get right down to it, our ability to make Vermont an even more inviting place for working families and jobs, or ability to grow our economy, make our state more affordable, give our kids the best education possible, all these things are tied to one common element, which is leadership. It's going to take strong, courageous leadership, the ability to listen, to build consensus, to set priorities, and manage projects in order to make real progress here in Vermont. And there's going to be some difficult decisions. We all know that, regardless of who is elected. But it's essential that we all tell the truth, don't overpromise, and always, always follow through. Because in the long run, with proper leadership, clear priorities, and team chemistry, the opportunities are limitless, particularly in this election se session or this season, where the national candidates have taken uh, negative campaigning to an entirely new level, a new low, I should say. And Hillary Clinton is absolutely right about one thing. Our children are watching. As we, heard, as we head into these final weeks of our campaign here in Vermont, I, for my part, will lead by example by keeping things civil, treating my opponents with the respect that we all deserve. And I hope that all candidates, as well as special interest groups who are weighing in with their own messages, will do the same. I hope you'll give me the opportunity to serve you as Vermont's next governor, and I will not let you down. Bill Scott. Thank you, Bill. We certainly appreciate hearing from you tonight. Thanks to Let's Grow Kids for the questions. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you at home. We certainly appreciate you tuning in as well. Can I give a plug? Is it okay? Is it okay to do? Another debate between these two on WCAX on <laughs> Tuesday night. Tune in at 7 o'clock. That concludes this candidate forum. We certainly appreciate all of your input. Vote November 8th. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you.